now a proud moment for South Africa as the University of Johannesburg's geology professor Nick Bukes has been elected to the United States National Academy of Sciences as an international member. Professor Bukes is now among 120 American and 30 international members elected for this year. For what this means, the country's geology sector, I am now joined by the new member of the United States National Academy of Sciences himself, Professor Nick Bukes. Professor, welcome to News PM and congratulations. No, no, thanks a lot. I appreciate you asking me to come out here. <laughs> it's an absolute <laughs> pleasure to have you here, Professor. Now, <clears throat> you have a number of accolades. You've accumulated so much in your lifetime. You've been rated as an A1 scientist by the National Research Foundation. You're a three-time recipient of the Jubilee Medal for publication in the South African Journal of Geology. You've also received a Lifetime Achievement Award, and I could go on and on. What does this um, uh, inclusion in the National Academy of Sciences mean to you, especially for whatever you'd be bringing in from an African perspective? Well, I think this to me was a great surprise, first of all, because I didn't really know that I was uh, sort of uh, suggested to be a member. And I was on my way to Barberton last week uh, driving, and uh, I was supposed to have a Zoom meeting with them where they were supposed to tell me uh, that I've been elected and congratulate me. And I didn't know about this. So eventually <laughs> it ended up as a short telephone conversation, and I was very surprised. And then, but the big thing is that I think to be elected to the uh, U.S. Academy of Science is quite a big honor because you are elected based on your contribution to science. And in my case, it would be the contributions that I've made over the years to the geology of South Africa, but also more specifically to the understanding of, of early Earth mineral systems or environments. So I'm talking now about rocks and things in South Africa that are more than two billion years old, you know. So uh, we are looking at early Earth systems. And, and these things are very important nowadays also for people to understand when we go into planetary sciences, yes. like people going to Mars and things like that. When they observe little things on Mars with taking photographs and things, if we can see the same things on Earth here, uh, we can better interpret what we're seeing on Mars. And that's one of the aspects I think that's nowadays pretty uh, common to study these old rocks. It's one of the a applications of studying these things. But there's a lot of other applications which I can talk about if you want me <laughs> to talk about There's it. a lot that we're going to talk about, Prof, and I want to get into that early Earth formations. I mean, you're considered a world expert on iron and manganese formations and, of course, the studies of early Earth surface environments. How important is it for us to even know about these in relation to climate change? Well, in relation to climate change, you know, the Earth is going through different cycles, and these cycles work on scales of millions of years. So at the moment, we are in a, a, a system of climate change where the Earth is getting warmer. You must understand that about 15,000 years ago, we were in an ice age, and every ice age is followed by a period of warming. Now, uh, the warming at the moment is part of the bigger geological time of involvement. Right. But mankind is doing a little bit of a glitch on that by burning a lot of fossil fuels and things like that. And so we've increased the climate in the last 50 years, probably by one degree or something like that. But as soon as we stop using all these funny burning things, then the world will just carry on, and we will probably still get warmer. I mean, there's no way that we can stop that until the Earth comes to the next cycle where it will start cooling. And we've gone through these systems many, many times in the, in the history of the world. So, uh, yeah, it, what I can say about climate change is that we should try to stop the one degree or two degrees, but we will not be able to stop the the geological history or the geological involvement of the world, of the world. Uh, through time. And we've been around here for four billion years, you know, so uh, 
That's the Quite interesting, interesting issue about very climate interesting. change. Another interesting project that you're currently working on, Prof, is the, the drilling project in the Barberton Greenstone Belt. In the most simplest form, can you tell us what that project is about and what you aim to achieve with that project? Well, you know, the Barberton Greenstone Belt uh, contains some of the oldest and best preserved rocks in the world of an age of about 3.2, between 3.2 and 3.6 billion years. And as part of those, that rock succession, there's a succession uh, called the Moody's Group. Now, the Moody's Group is a rock succession that was deposited mainly on land. Many of the older deposits were deposited in the sea or in deep ocean environments. But for a land deposit, the Moody's Group is the best preserved succession in the world. Now, the problem in the Barberton Mountain Land is that we have a lot of weathering there. You, I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's mountain land. There's a lot of rain. Right. The weathering profile is very deep. And so that the rocks that we can study on surface has been altered by weathering and groundwater movement. And to be able to understand the significance of those rocks, to, for example, understand whether at that time Earth had an oxygenated environment. In other words, there was oxygen, oxygen in the atmosphere. In the, right. We have to get fresh material. And it's for this reason that we got this funding from the International Continental, Continental Drilling Program with the headquarters in Germany. And they provide, provided us with 50% of the funding. The rest of the funding comes from uh, South Africa and nine other big universities uh, all over the world, from Japan, the US, uh, Europe, et cetera, et cetera. And we're using that funding, which amounts to probably something like 25 million rands, to drill eight deep holes in the Barberton Mountain land. We are very far advanced with the project. Uh, I think uh, on Monday we will start the second uh, last hole, and we hope to be done with this project by the end of September. The important thing about this project is that that drill core that we will get will be used with four geologists or scientific studies probably for the next 20, 30 years. Wow. So it's a long time, a long term investment on the geological heritage of South Africa. Mm -hmm. Half the core will go to Germany, to the ICDP uh, core storage facilities where they will be studied and the other half will be stored at the Council of Geoscience in Pretoria, where South African people can then study these rocks in the future. And I think that's a very nice contribution that we're making, and I'm pretty excited about the project. I'm only managing that, that on behalf of Samera. Uh, that's the Center of Excellence for Integrated Mineral Energy Resource Analysis at UJ. And then the other main scientists are from all over the world, but the real the guy who knows the Moody's group the best is a professor, Christoph Heubeck, and he's from Jena University in Germany. So we're working together on this. On this project. Prof, while I still have you here, we, we have the privy of, you've put together some beautiful rock images for us, and I'm hoping we'll be able to put them up right now, where these are rocks that are found in South Africa, but you say they have quite a significance in the importance of geology in South Africa. Can you take us through some of these rocks and no, what I, they mean to I us? I can do that if I can see them. I don't know where <laughs> they are. Well, let's hope <laughs> that on the screen there, Prof, we'll be able to see them here, but it seems as though we don't have them currently. But just take us through some of those significant ones, uh, uh, Prof. You see, the South African geology, we have one of the best geology in the world of ancient rocks, very old rocks. And I've been working on most of these successions here in South Africa and also in other parts of the world, in India, Brazil, the U.S., Canada, etc., etc. And those rocks can tell us something about, for example, when did oxygenic photosynthesis develop in the history of the world? Now, what is the significance of that? Me and you are both breathing oxygen, eh? Right. And we're feeling pretty energetic when we can do that. If we can't do that, we feel pretty bad. <laughs> but oxygen, the, and, and when the first oxygen was produced, 
that made available the existence of oxygen breathing organisms. Prior to that, there could not have been things like that. So the organisms breathed other things. Some breathed iron, some breathed manganese, etc., etc. But the oxygen breathing organisms came probably a little bit later. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the interesting questions in the world is when did oxygen breathing organisms uh, really start to develop, you understand? And that's one of the things we try to work on. When, when did oxygen become more abundant in the world? And that's one of the things that I've been working on with people at many other universities in, South Africa, in, in all over the world. And I think that's a very interesting question to ask. But to understand that, you have to look at certain rock types that could have formed from oxygen, mm -hmm. the presence of oxygen, or you could look at rocks that have structures that could have been formed by organisms like cyanobacteria that produce oxygen. And I'm working on three of these type of rocks mostly. So first of all, iron deposits, iron ore deposits, a thing called iron formations. It's a very interesting rock, but the oldest iron formation that we know of is one of the oldest sedimentary rocks in the world. It comes from Ishwab in Greenland. It's 3.8 billion years old. Sure. And there's quite a discussion of whether, and that thing is made up of hematite, which is an iron oxide, whether that was made by oxygen or whether organisms were involved in that. That's one of the questions. The other one that I'm working on is manganese. Now, to precipitate manganese, and South Africa has the biggest manganese deposit in the world, the Kalahari manganese field. It contains something like almost 80% of the world's resource of manganese. And manganese is known to be only formed when you have oxygen around. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting to study manganese through time to see when did they start to form, and then we can say maybe then there was oxygen around. And the other thing I've been working on a lot is on carbonate deposits, stromatolites. These are structures formed by organisms like cyanobacteria, and we have beautiful examples at present in Western Australia in a place called Shark Bay where these beautiful stromatolites grow presently. But we see exactly the same structures in the Northern Cape province in rocks that are 2.6 billion years old. So here we have a very nice comparison between the modern and the very ancient. And we know that at that time, these organisms probably formed oxygen already, which is a very important component of modern life. You understand? You I understand. understand. And I think that's what's so interesting for me about all of this. This is very short. interesting. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, I think I had a nice geology lesson there, and I'm sure many <laughs> of our viewers enjoyed this conversation. And also, once again, congratulations. Um, it's quite a great feat to have one of our own be featured in such a, a mon monumentous um, organization such yeah, as I that in the United so. States. I think it's quite, can I just say something that I think of, I've looked at the uh, the membership of the academy. My introduction to the academy will only take place at the first meeting next year in April, so I know very little about what will actually wait for me. <laughs> but I've looked at the uh, membership list, and there's only three other scientists at the moment from South Africa in, in, in that membership of about 2,500 Americans and 500 international members. So I, I consider this a quite a great honor or recognition of the work that I've been doing on South African geology and early earth mineral systems. You Thanks a lot for the interview. Yeah. Thank you That's so good. much, Prof. You certainly you. are doing us proud. And we wish you all the best, and we hope that you will be able to contribute as much as you can to that U.S. Academy. No. That is Professor Nick Bukes. He is the Professor of Geology at the University of South Africa, and he's recently been elected to the U.S. National Academy of Science. And from the University of Johannesburg. Yes, certainly <laughs> from the University of Johannesburg. Now,